We're in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. <laughs> There's things that scare me sometimes, I got to admit. I'm afraid of failure at times and different things that just put a panic in my heart. But I'll tell you what, this chapter, it's a wonderful chapter, but it is very, I fear that I will do justice to explaining it because it's all about God's plan for this planet. It's a, it's a plan that started at creation and it has continued on even when our sin has corrupted God's wonderful creation that we live in. It's a plan that takes a lot of twists, a lot of turns, uh, but it's a plan full of really surprising heroes, the heroes of the Bible. Uh, it's so awesome that you see their faults, just like our faults, and yet God used these men as they made themselves available. But also there's unexpected villains uh, in the Bible. But there's a problem with this grand story of God's unfolding plan, and it's this problem that we're going to start with and start to tackle through these next three chapters. This is a whole new section of the book of Romans. And of course, the overall theme of Romans is a righteousness that comes through faith. A righteousness that comes through faith. It is God's righteousness given to us through Jesus Christ. Amen? And so this is what it's all about. But, but we're going into one of the most difficult and controversial parts of the Bible. It's the ninth chapter of Romans in 10 and 11 also. Let me tell you something about this chapter. Friendships have ended because of disagreements on how to understand this chapter. Churches have split. Pastors have been fired. People have been excommunicated based on how they understand the ninth chapter of Romans. This is what's happened throughout the church, throughout the millennia. And today, as we start our third section of Romans, the key theme again is, um, is the righteousness that comes through faith, but we're going to see about, talk about God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness to his promises. And um, we can trust God to do whatever he promises. And if we lose sight of the fact that God's faithful, it's one of the major themes of this section and also a major theme within the Bible. No matter how we understand the particulars, we're going to keep the main thing the main thing. God is faithful. God is faithful. And so we're going to look at this dilemma in God's grand story. And then we're going to go uh, look at the three facts that can help us to solve this dilemma. First of all, let's look at the dilemma uh, here. I want to state it first before we read it. If Jesus fulfills God's promises to Israel, if he is the fulfillment of all the 300 or so prophecies of the Messiah that would, be, that would come to Israel, why do the Jewish people reject Jesus as their Messiah? If the Jewish people who take great pride in the fact that they are God's chosen people, then why have they at large overall rejected their Messiah? And what is God going to do about it? That's the dilemma. That's the dilemma. How does this all work? If they're chosen, you see, also we know that we've been chosen as individuals in Christ Jesus. They were chosen as a race of people in the sense that they were the Jews, the Semitic race, the Jews, the descendants of Abraham. We have been chosen not racially, but we've been chosen individually by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We've talked about that, uh, that ability of God to choose. And yet we also understand that we must choose. Well, which one is it, Mike? Is it God chooses or we choose? It's both. 
And that's what's going to be the hard to understand. And so as we read this, we keep that in mind that both things are true. Jesus has said, whoever, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him, choice, human choice, will not perish but have eternal life. And yet Jesus says, he says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Isn't that interesting? How can both of those things be true? Well, there's lots of things that to the human mind we cannot understand. How can God be one and yet three different persons? I don't have a clue. All I know is God, God, if God is God, he can do anything he wants to do. But I don't understand that mystery. I just declare the truth that God is one God, and yet he has revealed himself as God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I accept that because God is God. He can do whatever he wants. And so it is with men today in the church that they wanted to take one particular view of what we're talking about here over the other view because they want to have it all up here, so to speak. And so Calvinism has uh, uprooted, uh, has brought into this teaching that it's all about God's sovereignty, that everything depends upon what God does, uh, wills. And, and matter of fact, even sin is a product of God's will, which is bizarre to think about. But man has absolutely no choice if it wasn't that God made him be saved. And they also teach that not only has God chosen some to be saved, they teach that God has chosen some to be condemned. That God has chosen just as, as he has chosen some to be saved, God has chosen others to be the fuel in hell, so to speak, burned forever. That's what God has chosen you to be. No hope for you whatsoever. There is no human will that can change that. There is no faith that you have that can change. That's at the crux of the problem with Calvinism. Because the Bible clearly teaches that we do have a choice. It clearly teaches that God does not, is not willing that any, notice willing, will of God, is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. We're told that Jesus died for the sins of the, hello, behold, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist said, who, who died for, the, or who dies for the entire world. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Calvinists would say, no, he only took away the sins. It was a limited atonement where he only died for the ones he's chosen for, uh, for salvation. He never died for those people that go to hell. So you see what I mean? Pretty weird, isn't it? And quite honestly, if a Cal uh, Calvinism, I am convinced, could never be, be understood by just somebody coming up to the Bible and reading it. It is so twisted and convoluted. And there's so many passages that need to be reinterpreted from what they just say, plain say, to support the premise the five points of Calvinism, there's more to it than just those, that, that no one, it has to be a man's made system as far as I'm concerned. And it is extremely complex. And could you imagine me standing up here as a Calvinist and if I was really honest in preaching the gospel to the lost, I would have to say what, I'm really, uh, what I really believe and what, the, what I believe that the Bible says. And that is, well, folks, here's the good news. Jesus died for some of you, not all of you. Because God has chosen some of you to be saved, but he's chosen others of you to go to hell. It's his choice. It's not yours. You can't do anything about it. Only God can choose you. And he has already done that. And it's done. It's basically done. So here's the gospel. Jesus died for your sins, some of you. Jesus didn't die for some of your other sins. There's the good news. You can believe or, or not believe. 
And so it's a weird, twisted thing to, to really tell the truth. If you really look at Calvinism, and it's a strange gospel, and it's not a gospel of a God of love. That is not the loving God of the Bible that has brought that about. So, verse 1, enough of the lecture. I speak the truth in Christ, Paul says. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. And so Paul here states his heart, his burden. Paul, of course, being a Jew who has believed upon his Messiah. Matter of fact, he was a rejecter of the Messiah and a persecutor of the church, but that's where Jesus found him and converted him in the sense of his belief in the Jewish Messiah. No Jew is convert, converted from being a Jew. Matter of fact, it's the other way around. Gentiles or non-Jews are converted to being Jews, spiritual Jews. Jesus is the Messiah of the Jews. But it was always God's plan that the offspring of Abraham would not only be a blessing to the Jews, but to all the nations. It had always been that plan. But of course, the Jews had quite a hatred for non-Jews. And so in their mind, there was no possibility for non-Jews to be saved or to, unless they converted to Judaism and was circumcised if they're a man and you know, went through all the religious uh, dogma that they, that they represented. But here's the truth, guys. We think of Judaism and Christianity as separate religions, but they're really not. It's not entirely accurate. Jesus himself was what? Jew, right? From the tribe of Juba, Judah, Juba, <laughs> Judah, circumcised in the Jewish temple. He grew up in a Jewish home going to synagogue on every Sabbath. And although Jesus was critical of many of the things uh, about the way of the Jewish religion was taught to this generation, he lived his entire life according to the Jewish Torah. He celebrated the Jewish festivals like Passover. He, and the promises, uh, the day of promises were kept, okay? God has a plan. And, and it started at creation and it's continued even uh, uh, up to this day. All of uh, Jesus' 12 apostles were also Jewish. 25 of the 27 books we have in the New Testament were written by Jewish people. When the Christian church was born on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, all of the Christians were Jewish. And the church was entirely Jewish for the first 10 years of its existence. In early, in those early days, the Christian church was more like a subgroup of within Judaism rather than a distinct religion in its own right. But at the same time, or by the time that Paul is writing Romans, all, everything had changed, you see. The number of out non or Gentile Christians now began to outnumber the Christians, the Jewish Christians. And the Christian faith was starting to look more distinct from the Jewish, uh, from Judaism. And that was because of the conflict between the Jews that had believed in, in Jesus as their Messiah and the Jews who had not believed. They were causing so much uh, trouble between the two of them that the, um, the Roman emperor finally said, that's enough of them. I think it was Claudius that did this and exported all the Jews out of, out of Jerusalem. Well, then there was just in, 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 in Rome. And then there was only a Gentile believers left at that time. And it started to expand and it started to get much greater. And pretty soon when Nero came in, he, he um, said, okay, the Jews can return. And when they came back to their church in Rome, it was almost all Gentiles. Everything had changed. They were uncomfortable. And so that was the dilemma. And they started to ask questions of Paul. Well, where is God's faithfulness? 
how come all the Jews didn't all believe uh, and all these uh, other others are coming in? And so as we read this, that's the context of what was going on. And so there was this small, relatively Jewish Christian church, but then when they returned, it was a huge Gentile church that was happening. And so the first friction. So Paul's going to give us three facts to remember as we struggle to resolve this dilemma. And these three facts all draw from the Old Testament, the Jewish uh, Bible. Here's the first fact I want you to write down. We know that God has given his promises to Israel, don't we? As we read through the Old Testament. Look at verse 4. Theirs is the adoption as sons. There's the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. And so Paul mentions eight things that the Jews have been blessed with. First of all, their adoption as sons. God adopted the nation as his children, he says. There was the divine glory, the Shekinah glory of God at the tabernacle. Remember, he, he appeared even to the Jews in a, in a pillar of, of smoke and, and, and then also as light. And, and the Shekinah glory of God was what was present uh, that they could see. No one could ever really see what God looked like. He had to appear to them in his Shekinah or they would have died. The covenants were given to them. God's contracts were first of all given to the Israelites, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with Moses, and a new covenant which came with Jesus. The law was given to them. We see that in Exodus. We've been going through that in, on Wednesday nights. The Ten Commandments were given to who? The Jews. Temple worship was instituted to the Jews. They showed us how to worship God. And, and the sacrifices at the temple and all of that stuff were a shadow of what would come through Jesus Christ. And then there was the promises. God isn't finished with the Jews. And, and even today, we see the promises given to the Jews being fulfilled by the fact that there is a nation in, the, in Canaan today called Israel. That wasn't for thousands of years, guys, until 1948. And Jesus predicted this in many other prophecies, the prophecies of the dry bones in the desert, that they would come together and, and flesh would cover them and, and tendons would form and muscles would form and then a breath of life would be put into them. And he says, this is my people Israel, even though they're scattered through all the nations, I will bring them back in the last days, back into the land. Before my Messiah comes, I will bring them back in the land and they will have that, that land again. And so we see in our midst right now the promises of God being fulfilled. Notice verse 5, it says, Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ. And so the patriarchs were the great fathers of the faith, like Abraham, Jew, <laughs> Isaac, Jew, Jacob, Jew, Moses, Jew, right? Let's just get it all into our heads here for a second. And then the human ancestry of Christ, the greatest blessing of all from God was coming through the Jew, the Messiah. And so verse 5 at the end, it says about Jesus, who is God over all, forever praised. Here's one of the plain verses of the Bible where there is absolutely no other interpretation. But that Jesus was God and is God, I shouldn't say was, is God in human flesh. And so we see this beautiful thing about the deity of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying unequivocally, Jesus, the Messiah from the Jews, is God Almighty. I am the Alpha, I am the Omega, the Lord God, says Israel. But that's exactly what Jesus said he was, who he said he was. He called himself the great I Am, which the Jews knew. If he was only a man and taking that name was the name of God, the covenantial name. And so that would have been blasphemy if he was only a man. But Jesus took that name of deity because he is deity. 
Notice that all of these things, notice the law, the temple worship, the promises, notice that those are all in the present tense. All of these things that are listed. There's is the promise. There, there's uh, are the promises, rather. You know, there's are the patriarchs or the fathers. These are all in present tense. God has not given up on the Jew. Do you understand? There are many churches today that will teach you that when, when the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, that was the end of them as far as God's plan for them. And that the church actually replaced Israel. It's called replacement theology, which basically throws away probably at least a third of the Bible because it's ir irrelevant because there, if, if Israel is not still in God's blessing and still in a place that God is going to fulfill his promises, if he truly is finished with the Jew forever, then we might as well throw out a third of the Bible where it's all promises to Israel. So it's very, very important that we don't fall into this. Why? Because God gave Abraham that promise. Whoever curses you, Abraham, and your offspring, I will curse them. Whoever blesses you, I will bless them. And so it's very important that we as believers support Israel. We don't mean that they do everything right. They can do things that are wrong. But that we support their right to exist as God has brought them into this world miraculously. But if we are against Israel's existence, which, by the way, <laughs> nearly every nation on this planet is against their existence. Our own government has not yet recognized their own sovereign decision to make Jerusalem their capital of Israel. And we have rejected that. We will not send or put our embassy in Jerusalem. We put it in Tel Aviv. Because we do not believe that it is their land officially in the United States. Guys, we're on slippery grounds slippery grounds because if we curse israel god will curse us as a nation and so notice in verse four here theirs is the adoption that sons there's the divine glory the covenants the receiving of the law the temple worship and the promises verse five theirs are the patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of jesus christ and then the second fact, the first fact, is, is established. That God has made promises and is keeping promises to the land uh, of Israel. And the second fact, as we need to know, is that Jesus fulfills these promises. Jesus fulfills these promises. Look at verse 5, the second part. And from them is traced, what? The human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Do you understand? He is the Jewish Messiah. He came for the Jews first, according to Paul, and then the Gentiles. We are what, what, what he is going to explain later on. It are grafted in to the vine. The vine is Israel. And we, as an unnatural branch, all non-Jews are like an unnatural branch, being grafted into the promises of, that God has given to Israel. And so even his title that we say, he is Jesus Christ. Christ is, is the Greek for Messiah, the promised one. And so every time we say Christ, we're really saying Messiah. He is our Messiah. And so it's a beautiful thing. Jesus is that seed of the woman that's promised in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. He is the prophet of Moses promised in Deuteronomy 18.15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to him. Jesus is the, Messiah, the Passover lamb foreshadowed in the Jewish Passover uh, festival in Exodus 12.3. Tell the whole community of Israel 
that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. He is also the heir of David's throne promised in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me, and your throne will be established, notice, forever. According to the Jewish scriptures, the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. According to the Jewish scriptures, he would be born in a particular village called Bethlehem, as promised in 714. The Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and be given to a son. Be called uh, Emmanuel. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I misquoted the, the scripture. There's another scripture that promises that. I got the wrong one here. He was crucified according to the, uh, would be crucified according to the Jewish scriptures, Psalm 22, 16. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and feet. He was despised and considered a criminal, according to the Jewish scriptures and prophecy of the Messiah in Isaiah 53, 12. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils in the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And because he was raised from the dead, that also was prophesied in the Psalm 1610. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see decay. Guys, he is the Jewish Messiah. Prophesied over 300 different times in the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus himself said, I have not come to abolish the law, the Old Testament law. In the prophets, he says, but I have come to fulfill them, Matthew 5, 17. And so that means that there would be, and there indeed is, a great continuity between God's plan in the Old Testament and God's plan in the New Testament. It, it, it's, it's interlocked. It's continual. There is a scarlet thread that starts in the book of, of, of Genesis and, and goes all the way through the scriptures, all the way to the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ in the Christian church doesn't start a new story, but it starts a new chapter in the same story that we find in the Jewish scriptures, guys. That's why 39 of the books that Christians accept uh, uh, in their, as their own scriptures, the New Testament, was written by Jews. Look at the third fact, and I want to see this in verse 6. We know that God keeps his promises in unexpected ways. Look at verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed. The word for failed there is a sailing term that means to drift off course or to become uh, run aground. Okay, and he's saying it's not as if, um, you know, God's word or his promises had run aground or become shipwrecked. Do you understand? Uh, he says that for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Did you hear that? The first thing he talks about there is an ethnic Israel that comes through a bloodline that's racial. Right, And it can be a Jew, which is composed of all people of Jewish descent. But in Paul's generation, his own, as well as our own generation, the vast majority of these people don't accept Jesus as their Messiah. And yet within that ethnicity, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands who do believe in Jesus as their Messiah. And so there are some, he says, first of all, that are spiritual Israel. But there are others that are not spiritual Israel, even though they, they may live in Israel, they may be Jewish, but they have not received their Messiah. You see, in Paul's generation, they believed, the Jews did, that just being a descendant 
through a bloodline meant that they were saved, that they were in a covenantial relationship with God, but that's not uh, what it is at all. And so as long as you had a Jewish mother, they felt, hey, we're in, you know. And if you don't have a Jewish mother, you're, you're going to hell. That's all there was to it. But Paul now gives us two examples from the book of Genesis that bring that assumption into question. It's like uh, many of us that go to church, not everybody here, I'm saying by faith, it's not that I'm sitting there thinking of anybody here, but I just know this, that this is what happens in, in every church. There are people here that consider themselves a Christian. There might be one or two of you that consider themselves a Christian, but they've never been born again. And so it is very similar to a Jew that, that believes he's right with God because of his bloodline, but he's never made a commitment to Messiah. He's never believed upon Messiah. And so God, so he's saying in, in, in the word here that, that, that the true Jew is the one who has received their Messiah. And so he says in verse 7, notice, about Abraham, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return and Sarah will have a son. You remember that story. When Adam had disobeyed God, the entire human race became captive to the power of sin. And because of Adam's sin and because of our own sin, all humans, right, are under the power of sin. And so God had a plan for this all along. And according to the Bible's book of Genesis, God selected one person out of the human race to set into motion his plan, his plan of setting us free from the power of sin. And it was through this one man, Abraham. And God promised, among other things to Abraham, he said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, Genesis 12, 3. And this blessing for all peoples would be the reversal of the curse, you see, that brought us under the bondage of sin. It would be an opportunity for all people to find reconciliation with God, a freedom from the power and, and the bondage of sin. And so somehow through Abraham and his descendants, God promised to reverse Abraham, uh, uh, Adam's failure. And that was the whole purpose and plan. And it was going to come, notice, through Abraham's son, right? The only problem was Abraham was old like me. Maybe probably a lot, well, he was much older than me. I feel like Abraham sometimes. And also his wife was getting pretty old, too, well beyond childbearing years. And so when we look back at this at chapter 4 of Romans, remember, it was as at his wife Sarah's urging that Abraham had a child with Hagar, uh, her servant. And that caused a whole lot of problems, didn't it? We're reaping that today through the terrorism that is going on. God's plan was for Abraham to have a son with Sarah, and it was going to be a supernatural birth. It was going to be the child of promise, and that son would be called Isaac. But there's a problem now because Abraham has two sons. And, you know, which one will be stage two in God's plan to bring salvation, you know? Who's going to be the one that brings uh, the blessing? Through who? Which one? And so this example from Genesis proves that not every person genetically related to Abraham is a child of promise, do you see? But notice that Paul doesn't say anything. And here's the, here's the important thing. He doesn't say anything uh, about whether Ishmael was saved or not. Do you understand that? Matter of fact, I believe he was saved. He was named, remember when God renamed Jacob Israel, that's where the nation of Israel gets its name. But God also blessed Esau. And he made him into a great people and a great nation. But their offspring is where the Arab nation comes from. 
and the Arab problems that we have with the Jews, great hatred that's going down now. And so, clearly from Genesis, Ishmael does, does have a relationship with God, and God promises to bless Ishmael. But look at verse 10. It says, not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. And yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's promise in election or choosing might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. And, and so we see this, this passage. Notice she was told, the older will serve the younger. In verse 13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Woo, what is that? You mean you chose to love Jacob by, without any, him doing anything to earn it? And you chose to hate Esau be, with him not doing anything to, to earn your hatred? It was before any of them had done anything right or wrong? That doesn't seem fair, God. See, here's the problem. Here's the issues that come up. Guys, the term hatred is not an emotional term in this passage. It is not that, oh, I hate your guts. You know, one of those kind of things. You make me sick but it is rather a covenantial ter uh, term that is being used here. It is expressing God's choice in the covenant. It would be as if, you know, um, after dating, you know, in my life I dated girls before I met Julie, but now it would be after I've, after I've married Julie and, and, and entered into a covenant relationship with her, as I look back at these other women that I dated, it would be that kind of a thing. I don't hate them emotionally, but, it, but my commitment to Julie as my wife it, compared to those women is I loved her and I hated the others. Do you understand? And it's a covenantial term that is a way of, of Hebrew uh, writing and understanding here. It's not an emotional, I hate your guts, you know, kind of a thing. And so it's this covenantial relationship. So we have to understand this. The covenant is with the people of Abraham uh, the, the, through Isaac, not through Ishmael. And so we see that Ishmael today, through Islam, worships a God that they believe. Now, now if you follow what Islam teaches, they, they get it turned around. They say that, that it was Esau that was chosen by God, and it was actually, the, you know, it was Esau that was loved, and it was Jacob who was hated by God. They've twisted that around. And they said the Jews have corrupted their scriptures and made it go the other way, but it's really us that are the people. And so that's their lie. The lie of Islam is that they are the chosen people of God. What we're up against today with terrorism in Iran and also in Saudi Arabia or ISIS, remember we have two messianic groups fighting each other right now. They're in Iran, they believe in the last Mujahideen or the last, their, their Old Testament Messiah will come. And they believe that they need to bomb Israel and wipe out the Jew off the face of the planet, and then their Messiah will come and take over the whole planet for Islam. ISIS is, a, is, is from the Wahhabi religion. It's the, they're in contention with each other. They have some doctrinal issues, and they hate each other, and they kill each other. But Wahhabism, or ISIS, is the same, has, has a belief in the end times Messiah too. But their Messiah will come as they individually over, as they overtake the world and bring everybody under Sharia law, then their Messiah will show up. Do you understand? And so they're approaching it from those different paths and we're like wondering what in the world is going on? So many of our leaders, if you look at what our leaders believe today, none of them understand that. They don't understand that this is driven by by a belief in a coming Messiah. There's no way to stop them through reasoning with them because they really believe if they die, what's gonna happen? 
If they die killing you and they blow, them, blow you up and blow themselves up, they go up and, and have sex with a bunch of virgins. In their religion of works where they can never know that they're saved because they have to do enough to please their, their God, Allah, this is one surefire way to go because you're guaranteed, according to their theology, to go to heaven. So there's a lot of great eagerness to be a martyr. And that's why we see so much problems in this world. And there is no earthly hope to change it. No, no, making a treaty with Iran. Give me a break. These people are driven by a theology that believes that they represent Allah in the last days. And they alone are the ones that are called to destroy Israel off the planet or, uh, through nuclear they have stated it over and over and over and over again. And so to, to, to somehow say, hey, we're going to make a treaty with them that's going to hold them back from that is absolute lunacy. Lunacy. But we're living in these times that God has ordained. And I believe we're living in times where we're seeing our leaders be deluded. Just as much of our nation is being deluded because we've turned away from God in this nation so much. We've turned away from his wisdom, from his word. And we're no longer looking at this world through the lens of what the Bible's de Bible declares from the beginning of time and ordained and the prophecies that are, are contained. Man, if we would, things would be much different than they are today. Notice in our verse there, it says, she was told that the older will serve the younger. And so it is. God's not being harsh. It's just that he, he loved Jacob and his covenant would be through Jacob. And in the end, it would be that Esau would be lesser to Jacob, that he would be in, in the end uh, serving Jacob and, and Jacob would be greater. And so God never chooses people to play favorites but God is choosing lineages so that he might bring about his Messiah. And that's what he did through Jesus Christ. And now we're living in this times, guys, when, when the church is largely Gentile, even though it is Jew, made up of Jews as well, Jew and Gentile alike. And we're living in these end times now, and we're seeing, guys, things going on in a, in, a, in a great increase in speed in prophecy. We're living in the books of Ezekiel, chapter 46, 47, 48. You read those scriptures and you see that the nations around Israel are described in prophecy. That it would be Russia in the end times that would be supporting Iran against Israel. Hello? that it names all of the nations that would be the enemy of Israel. Guess what? In, in chapter 47 and 48, guess what? Every single one of them are Muslim today. It's absolutely fulfilled, absolutely accurate. And there will be a coming time when all of these nations, again, they already did it once. They actually did it twice. 1948, all Arab nations came against Israel to wipe them out. Miraculously, they were defeated because God was, was supporting and protecting Israel. They only had two airplanes back then, and they had borrowed them from some country and their old relics of World War II. And it's amazing that they turned back all of the advanced uh, arms that, the, that Egypt had and, and uh, Jordan and all of the, the nations, Iran, all of them. They all came against Israel. Then we had the Six-Day War in, in 1967, where again, they tried to overcome Israel. What ended up happening in that six days, not only did Israel beat them back, but they took and made a buffer around their land. You know, Israel is so small. At one place in, their, in, in the ge geography, the original Israel that, that was given by the um, United Nations, but it was really God doing this, is only 20 some, th some odd miles you know, uh, to go in and go through. And so they made a buffer by taking the West Bank. 
by taking the land from Egypt back, taking land from Jordan, all of those areas, so that they could have more warning time when they're being invaded. And he said, let's make peace. Just accept that we're here. Quit quit trying to wipe us off the planet. We won't have a problem with you. We'll be good neighbors to you. And so Jordan made a peace treaty. All the land that they had taken from Jordan was taken away. Last time I was in Israel, we, well, second to the last time, I actually went to the River Jordan, and it was just from about here to the sound booth wide at that point. And there's Jordan. And the, there was some troops on the other side, and we waved, and they waved back at us. That's Jordan. They're in a peace treaty with Israel. Israel gave back all the land back to them that they originally took from them. Egypt made a peace treaty with Israel. And so all of the Sinai, all of the thousands of square miles that Israel took in that war was given back to them. And so when you go to Israel, you can actually go to the border of Egypt. And it's right there because there is a peace treaty being made and and being fulfilled. And so just allow the Jews and what Israel's asking, allow us to live in our land, allow us to recognize that we have a right to exist. Almost sounds like abortion, doesn't it? That today, as we're killing babies, we're denying their right to exist. And we say, well, it's the woman's choice to make that decision of whether you have the right. I'll never, I'll never forget that one of our high schoolers at the time, he was, there was a debate in their classroom And one half of the class was to take the pro-abortion stance, and the other uh, half was to take the pro-life stance, and they were to debate each other. And what made every mouth close and and complete silence came when when our uh, high schooler from this church stood up and said, you know what I just found out yesterday as I was talking to my mom and dad, that Uh, Up to, uh, I was about one hour from being aborted when my mom was pregnant with me. And at the very last minute, she decided to not have an abortion. And he said, you know what? I believe I have a right to exist. And who could say anything? (laughs) Who could say anything? No, you don't. No. Mom, your mom could have killed you and it would have been fine. You know, you don't have any right to exist. You don't have any self-autonomy just because you were in the womb. And it's and it stopped. Guys, that's what Israel is asking for. And that is what God has ordained. And guess what? It's going to happen. Because as we're waiting for the, what seems hopeless with the Arab and, and Israeli conflicts that are going on, as we're looking at this and, and we read the news and we hear the news and it's just so bad and so awful and the terrorism that's going on, guess what? Jesus said, when you see these things happen, don't be afraid. They must happen, but the end is still yet to come. And he says, you know what? In a twinkling of an eye, before the last seven years of, of tribulation where it's going to get so crazy, that we, we would never want to be here. That last seven years of tribulation, I will come and take my church out of this world. And then the end will come down. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And what? To do what? To take you to be where I am. That's the rapture. And it will happen before the wrath of the last seven years of tribulation because Jesus himself said, you, uh, the church is not appointed unto wrath, but unto salvation. And we will be taken up. And then the restrainer, the great restrainer that, believe it or not, as bad as things are, it's been, evil is being restrained right now. It's not nearly as bad as it could be. But when the church is taken out and the Holy Spirit who is within each and every one of us as believers and the influence of holiness that he has in us, in this world, 
is raptured, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the way so that evil might become as evil as it wants to be. And that is the last seven years of tribulation. And then guess what, guys? Here's what we're going to, I'm going to finish with this. During the, during the Old Testament, God's eye in his effort was on developing his people, the Jews, Israel, to be his people and to represent him and to bring forth a Messiah that would save the world. When Jesus died on the cross and Israel rejected them, many believed and the church came into existence at that time. And from then until right now, God's focus has been on building the church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is, is that one that's, that's bringing us together to present us as the bride unto Christ one day. When he takes us up out of the way, God's purpose and plan now and his focus becomes back on Israel again. It's like a great big pause in the Jewish uh, prophetical uh, uh, calendar. This pause is where the church has come into existence and is growing. God will take us up out of the way, and guess what? During the last seven years of tribulation, you know what the main focus is? That Israel, those that remain behind during that last seven years, the pressure of, of what's going to happen will become so great that they will cry out to the one whom, in whom, whom they pierced, the one whom they crucified, and they will believe upon their Messiah and in the book of Revelations, it says that a great multitude will believe during that time. There will also be those who believe that are Gentiles during that time. Some people that in our lifetime, when we go to be with the Lord, we've left behind a lot of seeds in people's hearts. They will see that we're gone, first of all. There will be some kind of an explanation because an antichrist will arise, a world leader. And he will surely lie and try to deceive them for the reason of why we've been taken out of the way. But there will be some that will remember and they will have faith in Christ. And yet it will be such a terrible time to believe in Jesus. Well, it'll be a great time. It's always a great time to believe in Jesus. But they will literally be hunted down and be killed for their faith. But the main emphasis is that God is going to look back at the promises of Abraham and he's going to fulfill that promise that the Messiah would rule over Israel for a thousand years, the millennial kingdom. And that will come at the end of the tribulation as Jesus comes and stops the evil, casts Satan into uh, bondage and all the demons of hell and every unbeliever at that point, and Israel will continue on this planet for a thousand years. And guess what? We're going to be with Jesus ruling over the Jew. Not in the sense that we're like, you know, the kings over these little guys, but, but that we, we will be like state workers for the kingdom of Jesus, okay? We will be people that will rule, co-rule and reign with Christ over that thousand years on this earth. That's where our future is. We will have access to this earth and also unto heaven. And then at the end of that, I won't go into every detail, but there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And guess what? There'll be a new earth that's made even better, I would, I, I would guess, even better than the original earth that was made. And God will make this for us in heaven itself. The new city of Jerusalem will be prepared and brought down on earth. And heaven will be on earth. That's where we will be. That will be heaven forever and ever and ever. Pretty cool, isn't it? God's got a plan, guys. That's what I'm trying to come down to. God has got a plan for me to knock the mic over. It's God's will. Anyway. I didn't have anything to do with that. Um, God's got a plan. And guys, as we, I want to close with just this thought. I know I've been going on. I know this has been difficult to sit through all this, but a lot of facts, a lot of things. But here's the deal. Guys, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Some of us say, oh, I can't stand listening to prophecy. I don't want to, I don't want to know more. It's just too scary. It's too weird. It's too negative. No, it's not. That's where you don't get it. 
It's exciting because as we see these things being fulfilled, we know that we're closer than ever before that our Messiah will take us out of here and bring us into the, his presence and fulfill this plan for this planet where this planet will be restored, where, the, where righteousness will be restored, where our children will be able to live w- without all of the, of, the, of the struggles that they have today. And it tells us also, hey, get out there in the kingdom and, and spread the seeds of the sower. Spread the seeds of the gospel for, and bring in the harvest that God has today because he is still saving people. Amen? He is still saving people. And so let's be part of that as we see the end drawing near. And let's, give, let's be people with hope because the rest of this world, they look at this and say, man, oh man, I don't even want to know about this. This is horrible. And we keep getting deeper and making wrong decisions in this world and, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. You see, God knew that. That's why he's given that of us prophecy. He's warning us ahead of time. It's going to get worse. But as it gets darker, guys, let's shine all the brighter for Jesus. Amen? Lord, we thank you for your plan. We thank you that you indeed are sovereign, that you rule and you reign, and no one can thwart your will. And we thank you so much, Lord, that in the midst of all this, you have elected us, you have chosen us. And we feel so indeed blessed, Lord, that we believed upon what you've done, the goodness of your, uh, of your offer to us, that Jesus would pay for our sins. Lord, we don't understand everything we could possibly understand. How can we have freedom of choice and you... Uh, be absolutely sovereign. We don't understand those two things. We, we won't understand them, I'm sure, until we get to be in heaven. But Lord, we just accept on our part that even today, anyone here that would say, Jesus, I desire you to come into my life, into my heart. I desire for you to save me of my sin and to wash me clean and make me heaven bound. That anyone that comes to you right now through faith alone will be saved. And while eyes are bowed and ears are, or eyes are closed, (laughs) heads are bowed, ears are open, I just ask, is there any here that would just raise their hand right now? And what you're saying is, Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me today and wash me clean. I recognize you are my salvation. And I'm coming to you without anything in my hands and just trusting what you did on the cross for me. And I'm turning away from my old life. And I'm turning towards a new life in you. Is there any here that would just raise their hand and say, I want to receive Jesus Christ? Thank you over there. Thank you. Any, Any others that would just say thank you there? would like to receive Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, thank you back there. If you know the Lord, don't, you, you don't get resaved over and over and over and over again. If you've made that commitment to the Lord, then you will be born again. And Jesus said, I, I will, all who come to me, I will no wise cast them out. My Father has them in their hand and nothing can pluck them from my Father's hand. But if you've not yet trusted Christ, and I mean made a commitment to him, today is a day. Today, his mercies are new. Father, we thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for me. I thank you, Jesus, that your blood purchased and redeemed me because my sins are manifold, Lord. And I thank you that you died for every single one of them. And I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and my Lord. And I pray that you would come into my heart and make your home in me. And Lord, I'm willing to change. I don't know how I can change. I I can't do it. But I pray that you would do it. Because I do desire a new life. And I come to you on that basis of what you've done for me, Lord. Not what I can do or I have done for myself. 
Thank you, Lord, for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hey, one more.